Um, well, it's great to be here. Um, basically, the nature of farming is that it's a, um, it's a, it's a really capital intensive business. And it can be, I guess the perception is it can be a, a low margin business as well. But our view um, is that it's, it's basically really, like probably any business, really knowing and understanding the, the three or four factors that have the greatest impact um, on your profits. And then focusing on those can actually have a massive, um, I guess a disproportionately large impact on profits. So I'm going to use our benchmarking analysis and I'll give you a bit of information about us in a sec. Um, to show what the best farmers in our client groups and our survey groups are actually doing to, um, to, to really improve their investments. Now, I know that um, I probably shouldn't be throwing stones, but he looks pretty unfit for someone who came up with the theory of survival of the fittest. But in our industry in WA, I'm WA bus in case I didn't say that, we're, we're down to now about 3,100 broadacre farmers, that's wheat sheep type farmers, that um, that are basically cropping more than about 1,000 hectares. So the people I'm talking about are at the larger end of the group that, um, that Peter was talking about a few minutes ago, and, and that'll become pretty obvious in a few minutes. That number is down nearly 20% in the last 15 years. So we're seeing quite an attrition of our, um, of our farmer population. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the data from our, our long-term data set. It's a, it's a rolling six-year data set, and where we look at the detail of each of our clients. Um, it's data we collect during an annual review process, which I'll talk about in a sec. And what we see in that is our top 25% of farmers are consistently averaging a 8% return on capital, while the average farmer is generating, in a group, is generating about 4%. And that distance, that 4% difference, if you like, is pretty much the same distance back to the, the bottom 25% of farmers. So, I guess if you're looking at this group, you can say there's a real future for the guys who are generating 8%. And for the people at 0% average return on capital for the last six years, they've, um, they've got some problems. But what I'm also going to show in this data is that this is um, farm production data or farm financial performance data, excluding changes in land values. So you can add a land value change to this, and we'll talk a bit about that as well. Um, in essence, what I'm saying is that farming can be a pretty good place to invest, um, as long as you buy well and manage well, in the words of uh, David Sackett, I think that was. Okay, a bit about us and our, our analysis. So, Plan Farmer Consultants to Farmers in Western Australia. We cover most of the, um, the wheat belt areas of Western Australia. Um, the people we'll be talking about um, are dominated by the family farm. They're almost entirely the family farm. There's, there's a few corporates in there as well. They have an average of about 4,000 hectares that they're farming, as I was saying, right at the upper end. And, um, and they have a business equity of about $7 million. So they're, they're a quite a large group of farmers. And the data I'm talking about is a subset of this survey that we, we put out. It's available to people for, for free. We basically do it as an industry good. Uh, it comes from data from our client base, um, Bank West, people at Johnston Williams, Dave Watson and Dave Falconer. Now, for those who aren't familiar with WA, um, this is a broad acre ag region in Western Australia. Um, it's really the area that we're talking about. The higher rainfall areas are nearest the coast. The, um, we're breaking it up into a north zone and a south zone. That pretty much comes, if I can get this working, from that line there is about where we do, do the dividing for the north and the south. So in the north, it's shorter growing seasons, warmer growing seasons. In the south, it's um, longer growing seasons, but more subject to frost. And let's do that. Now, if we just, a couple of um, just positioning type slides, and they, they fall into place with some of the other talks earlier today, is this is the wheat yield variation um, of our clients in two regions, Meriden and Wongan Hills, over the last, um, well, really since 1961 from our client data. And what you can see from this is the, um, they've had a steady increase in yields up until about 99, 2000, but then, and those who went to the, uh, the talk with the Bureau of Met guy just in the last session, uh, he was talking about an increase in volatility from 99. Well, that certainly shows up in our data. Uh, we're seeing massive increases in volatility and it's giving us some of these real challenges we have with our farming group at the moment. Um, and we are in a region that's subject to, um, to climate change. What we also have had um, is the decline in equity. If you follow the black line, um, in the from that period of 99 through to the late 2000s, we had a, a significant decline in equity in our client base. Where the green line takes off in about 99 or 2000, 
that's where we had the change in marketing system coming in and the green line is an adjustment to equity to take into account people holding onto their grain longer because they didn't have the AWB pools operating anymore. But um, so we can see in the last couple of years, we've had a couple of good seasons now and people are getting on top of this management around with drier climates, or at least starting to, um, we're starting to see that equity figure stabilise. So let's get into some of the, the actual data part of it and I'll be, I'll give it as an overview is probably the best way to cover it. This is the, the return on capital of our top 25% of farmers. Now the top 25% are, um, are generating this 8% return on capital but what becomes immediately obvious from this slide, now they're the zones, the rainfall zones, the, the one and twos of the north, the three, four, fives of the south and H for high, medium, um, for medium or M for medium. So what you'll see is I've highlighted the, um, the years in which the top 25% are generating greater than a 10% um, return on capital. And what you can see is that's happening in a couple of years, it doesn't happen in every year. So these guys, yes they generate an 8% return on capital, which is fantastic, but um, they don't do it every year. So there's probably two take homes from here. One is that um, when they do generate a very good return or have the opportunity to, they take it and they take it really, really well. The other thing that you'll notice on there is very, very few negatives. Um, these guys rarely make losses as individuals and as a group. And it's one of the big learnings out of, um, out of this exercise. So they're getting very, very good at um, adapting their management to the seasons and the volatility or the variability we're seeing in the seasons at the moment. So if we leave aside the other crops they grow on livestock, I focus, I'm going to focus in the interest of time just on a couple of areas and, um, and look at the differences between the top 25% and our average group. And this one's wheat yield. And you'll notice that the number's incredibly small. They actually generate, consistently though, only 0.08 of a tonne. It's about 80 kilos a hectare difference in wheat yield. And there's actually some years in those periods, highlighted in green, when they generate a lower yield than what the average client does. And if anyone who's familiar with WA will know that the 2010 year and the 2012 year were particularly dry years. So what's happened, our, our top 25% group of farmers have actually done a far better job of pulling back their, their expenditure to match the season and hence they have a much better chance of not making a loss. So if we take that difference, if we take that 0.08 of a tonne, that 80 kilos, multiply it out by a farm gate price of about $250 a tonne, that'll give you a, um, a difference of about $20 a hectare. And if you can remember that for a few minutes, we'll carry on. If we look at the operating costs, the difference in the operating costs for these guys, whoops, hasn't switched over, is only about $18 a tonne, uh, $18 a hectare on average. Now once again, the green are the years when the top 25 has generated lower operating costs or used, had lower operating costs. And you'll notice that the years that they spent more, in this case were 2009 for the M345 and L345, and the same thing in 2013. But those two years were generally pretty good years in WA. So once again, this group has been much better at actually chasing the seasons. Um, the differences in operating costs are driven largely by the chemical spend, the fertilisers, the repairs, and to a lesser degree fuel. So if you're looking for the three or four things to focus on in this part of it, it's just those areas, the, um, those uh, fuel chemi sorry, chemicals, fertilisers and repairs. And the third area that I wanted to talk about with this is um, the wheat prices. So uh, the difference in wheat price that our best farmers are achieving is only $3 a tonne, but they're doing it consistently again. And it varies depending on region, as, as you'll see in that slide. Um, if we take that, that difference, that difference of $3 a tonne, that's um, over a wheat yield of about two tonnes of a hectare, that works out to about $6 a hectare. Now, if we were to apply, to apply that number into the operating profits, the differences in operating profits from our groups, it's about $44 a hectare. Now, it just happens to add up. It hasn't in any of the other years that I've run it. Um, it's usually within a dollar or two, but not a mile out. But, um, so really what it's saying is that if you were to take a 4,000, actually, I'll come back to that in a sec, but I should also point out, this is something that the family farm unit does really well. Um, the corporates seem to struggle a lot more with this difference. Now, so if we take those numbers, back to what I was about to say, the, um, the $44 a hectare difference in average um, farm operating profit from these guys over the 4,000 hectares for um, the six years that we're running this, this analysis for, 
that adds up to about a million and fifty six thousand dollars of difference in actual performance and um, when we look at the changes in equity once again um, without land value change the top 25 percent of guys have, um, have generated about 2.15 million dollars of gain the average business has generated about nine hundred and sixty nine thousand dollars worth of gain and the difference is about 1.18 so really we can explain probably about 80 to 90 percent of the difference in the performance of these guys just by a little bit of wheat yield because it's a dominant crop um, a little bit of operating costs and a little bit of grain pricing then if we were to try and wrap that into a total return for farms um, we've had a few guys mention today that we've seen um, farm land values grow by about five percent a year um, the data from our land gate uh, providers, which is the Department of Land and Administration in Western Australia, shows that for, for two shires, I picked Camelling in the medium high rainfall zone and um, and Wongan, uh, sorry, and Meriden, and they've had a compounded annual growth over the last well since 1970, so that's the last 42 years, of about um, six to seven percent, but it's very chunky. So as you can see from these charts, it stays relatively static for long periods of time, and then it does a rapid increase. And if we look at the last 10 years when we've had changes in climate and a bit more variability and people getting a bit more concerned about what's happening with our climate, we've seen very slow growth to no growth. Um, Gamaling we've seen 2% in the last 10 years. Um, in Meriden we've seen 0% growth in the last 10 years. And Meriden's a lower rainfall, so therefore it's much more subject to the variability we're seeing in climate. So what I'm really saying is overall, a farmer can generate 4% to 8% return on capital if they're doing it reasonably well from operations and probably another 4 or 5, maybe 6 or 7 if they're lucky from uh, land value returns, but, um, which is getting quite good. Now, just to touch on some of the differences between these farmers, and this slide, you'll notice it's a different looking slide, comes from um, some study that we did with GRDC and um, Department of Agriculture and WA. Um, a few years ago and we interviewed a number of those people who are consistently in that top 25% group and we're just going to touch on a couple of the things that they do. Um, I put passion at the top, it's very much a motherhood statement but it's also very much a drafting gate as well. The guys who didn't have any passion or were lacking in passion weren't in the top 25%, it was a given. But all of the rest are, are very real. So. Um, the guys who are in the top 25% are consistently very good planners. They're very well prepared, always well prepared. They're always really committed. They always get the job done. It's always done on time, exactly on time or early. So they get those decisions right and they're very good at um, adapting to, the, to what the season presents them. So, so to summarise, just really wanted to um, get people to focus their attention on the things that matter for their business. I've talked about what matters for our businesses in um, in a broad acre wheat sheet type enterprise but from what I can see in other businesses as well it's every industry has those three or four or five things that really drive their profits and to focus on those is absolutely critical. Um, know your property, know your margins, your seasons, what's, what's likely to happen and know how you're actually going to manage that. Look for the small gains in production. It's The differences in profits are small, they, you don't need to make big changes, they're just little ones. Chase the savings in your spending know a good price when it's there and take it. Um, don't try and chase rainbows. Just get the basics right and don't compromise. And look, that, that pretty much brings me to a close. Thank you.